Hi and welcome to the first video in my new series on quantum field theory. In this series, I would like to introduce quantum field theory, starting from using only probability theory and calculus. There is a lot to say about quantum field theory, which in my eyes is the most beautiful model of the world we currently have, and I won't have time to talk about everything in this video series. However, my plan is to start with the zero-dimensional quantum field and build up from there to construct all kinds of quantum fields in our four-dimensional space-time. In this video series, I will only assume you have experience with calculus, but if you have any questions about the mathematical results in this video, please do not hesitate to write them down in the comments below. Now without further ado, let us dive right into the foundations of quantum field theory. As promised, we will start in zero dimensions, which is a space consisting of just one single point. We can assign a random real value to this point, which we call phi, which can take any value between minus and positive infinity. Because this is a random variable, the only thing we can assume about it is that it is described by some kind of probability density. Let us write this probability density, without loss of generality, as n times e to the minus s of phi, where s is called the action of our random variable, and n is a normalization constant to make sure that if we integrate this probability density, we get 1. Right now, we have written our probability density as some totally arbitrary function of phi, so let's see what kind of functions we can get by choosing a properly defined action. What can this action be? Well, the simplest action would be a constant number, so no phi dependence, but if we choose this, we would have to pick a normalization constant that goes to zero, so it is not really a useful probability density. What if we pick an action to be linear in phi? This means our probability density goes to zero if phi goes to infinity. However, if phi goes to minus infinity, the probability density goes to infinity as well, so again it is no well-defined action. The first useful function we get is when the action is quadratic in phi. We call this the free action, for reasons that will become clearer later on. We can now start adding higher terms in phi, but for simplicity, let us stick with this free action. To get a better idea about the behavior of this probability density, it is useful to determine its moments. The nth moment of a statistical variable is defined like this. The zeroth moment should then always be equal to 1, and the first moment is what you know as the expectation value of the field. Using these moments, we can also compute the variance, the skewness, and so on. For the free action, if we write it as 1 half times mu times phi squared, we can compute all moments to be zero except for the variation, which is equal to 1 over mu. This is also evident from the graph on the right, where we see that the mean must be zero, the variance is 1 over mu, and since the graph is otherwise symmetric, the higher moments also vanish. Now let me introduce some useful functions and terminology to study our quantum field further. Let me start by adding a little subtlety into our equation for the probability density of our quantum field. Even though we have no reason yet to be talking about units, since we are living in a zero-dimensional world, I would still like to add a constant inside the exponential, which will later make sure the units in our theory will be correct. You might recognize this constant from quantum mechanics, but for now we just see it as some arbitrary constant in our probability distribution. We can do this again with no loss of generality. Next, in quantum field theory, we don't speak of moments, but instead we call them Green's functions. So the nth Green's function is defined like this. In order to get a better handle on these Green's functions of our quantum field, we can choose to multiply the probability density with a factor e to the j phi, where j is called the source, again for reasons that will become clear later on. The integral over this new probability density is now defined as z of j, which is called the path integral. Note that if we set j equals zero, we simply get the integral over our original probability density again. Now observe how if I take the derivative of the path integral with respect to j, our integrand gains a factor phi over h bar, and we can repeat this process to add any number of phi's in the integrand we want. Therefore, 
We can obtain the nth Green's function by taking the nth derivative of the path integral with respect to j. Multiply by h bar to the n and then set j equals zero. Using all of the just mentioned terminology, we can say that the expectation value of our quantum field is equal to the first Green's function or h bar times the derivative with respect to j of our path integral after we set j equals zero. Finally, let me be very clear about the different notations of our quantum field. If I write phi itself, I'm talking just about the randomly fluctuating quantum field. Phi between brackets denotes the expectation value of this quantum field. Since we are adding sources to this field, I can also write down the expectation value of our quantum field in the presence of a source like this. Whereas phi itself is just a random variable, its expectation value is a function that can be computed, and I will from now on therefore write it as phi of j. Note that this is very different than phi itself. From the path integral, I will now derive the schwinger dyson equation, which is a very useful equation in quantum field theory relating Green's functions in the theory. Take a look at the path integral again. Notice what happens if I multiply the integrand by minus the derivative of s with respect to phi, here denoted as s prime of phi, plus j multiplied by the inverse of h bar. This term is exactly the derivative of the exponential term with respect to phi. We can perform this integration, and since the integrand vanishes at plus and minus infinity, we get that the integral is zero. Say we take our free action again, and the derivative of this action with respect to phi is given by mu times phi. If we fill this equation into our path integral, notice that the same expression is obtained by replacing all the phi's with h bar times the derivative with respect to the source j. Since every derivative simply adds a phi over h bar in front of the exponential, these two forms are equivalent. Now we can take the added term outside of the integral and have it act on the path integral. Since the whole thing equals zero, we can move one term to the left hand side and there we have the Schwinger Dyson equation for our free action. We can generalize this result for any action by noting that all we did is replace the phi's in the derivative of the action in our equation with h bar times the derivative with respect to j. So, the left hand term of this equation is this derivative of the action acting on the path integral where all phi fields are replaced by h bar times this derivative. We can rewrite this equation to create a Schwinger Dyson equation for the field expectation value phi of j. It takes a few lines of mathematics to get to this result, and I don't want to add any more mathematics to this video than necessary, so all I will say is that if you study the derivatives of the path integral with respect to j closely, you'll manage to find the following relation for the field value phi of j. Here s prime again is the derivative of the action with respect to the field phi, and instead of inserting phi itself, we insert phi plus h bar times the derivative with respect to j. We have this whole expression act on the function e of j, which is just a number 1 written as a function. We will use this equation a lot when studying fields with all kinds of actions. Say we choose the action s equals 1 half times mu times phi squared again, the Schwinger Dyson equation becomes phi equals j over mu. Note that if we set the source to zero, we get that the expectation value of a free field is zero, just as we have seen before. With all of these definitions out of the way, let us finally increase from zero dimensions to one spatial dimension. The way we do this is to just add many zero dimensional quantum fields in line like this each labeled with an integer number so we can study them. Of course this labeling is arbitrary and we are allowed to shift them any way we want. Now let's write down the action of this infinite set of zero dimensional quantum fields. For each of the fields we write a quadratic term 1 half times mu times phi n squared. And let us include the source terms into the action as well by subtracting j n times phi n, where of course we sum over all n. This would be an incredibly boring theory if we didn't have some interaction going on between these quantum fields. In order to create a local theory, let's say each quantum field only has interaction with its neighbor fields. We insert this into the action 
by inserting the term minus gamma times phi n times phi n plus 1. Now that we have our action, let us use the Schwinger Dyson equation to find an expression for the expectation value of each phi n. The Schwinger Dyson equation tells us to take the derivative of our action with respect to phi n, then replace each phi n with the expectation value of phi n in the presence of sources j, plus h bar times the derivative with respect to jn, and then have it act on the 1 function. The result is the equation right here, which gives the dependence of our quantum field labeled n on the quantum fields labeled n plus 1 and n minus 1. This equation is therefore a nice starting point to derive a propagator function in our theory. As promised, I will let this information sink in a little, while I work on my next video where we will derive the propagator of a scalar field in 4 dimensional spacetime. I based most of the information in this video on the fantastic textbook Quantum Field Theory – A Diagrammatic Approach by Ronald Kleiss. In this book Quantum Field Theory is derived using the intuitive Feynman diagram notation, and I highly recommend buying it if you want to learn quantum field theory in a clear and concise way. I put a link to the book in the description. For now thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.